Okay, so here we are. Here's all of the uh, fun facts. Uh, one of the interesting things you should note is we have two directors on this, where Donnan did most of the directing work. Gene Kelly actually directed a few of his own dances in the film. So uh, it, it's one of those rare films that has multiple directors, but it, I don't think it suffered from the uh, from that in any way. So here's all the songs featured on the film. I'm not sure if they're a particular order. All right, what do I have in bold here? Let's yes, because we're uh, studying this week. That's right, we're studying editing this week, so you should know a little about about Adrian Fazan. Adrian was an award-winning American editor. Uh, started cutting films in '33. She's from Germany. Uh, she did a lot of interesting work: uh, Telltale Heart, Singing in the Rain in '52. She actually was edited for and won a Best Filming uh, Editing Oscar for An American in Paris. That was the nomination. And Gigi was the win uh, that was directed by Minnelli. She worked with Minnelli on both of those films. So uh, one of her last films was The Cheyenne Social Club, a great Western if you haven't ever seen it. So there's your editor for the week. So uh, this film, and one of the reasons that I chose it, as you might rec uh, figure out, is that it's all about the history of motion pictures and the development. So where does that happen in this film? Somebody walk me through it. Anybody? Anybody? Well, I mean, whenever they initially start, they like are vaudeville performers, and then it kind of goes through their progression into cinema, and then from silent film to talks talkies and stuff like that so very good very good uh great start anybody else have additional um i think it's really interesting how not only does it start with um and this could be a point that's not a point but how i kind of took it as it started with like the silent films and then it had the trial and error process of talkies really not working um, and then they figured it out and then because it's a movie musical and then the premise of the movie musical is that they make a movie musical out of the dueling cavalier um, it also kind of showed the transition into movie musical so you've got like the very basic silent films you've got the talkies and then you've got the synthesis of musical theater and film that we have today very good 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 two good responses so uh, as I usually do when we were in uh, the real world, uh, talk to me about your overall reaction to the film. I saw, I think I've read most of your Moodle post and people were mostly quite thrilled about the film. So what did you like about it and what was problematic about it or parts of it? I really, it was way funnier and I talked about that in my post. It was so much funnier than I anticipated, but not only that, it was funnier in a more like, it could stay on the test of time way like oh. it's still hilarious right now and my favorite like one of my favorite points was I was really angry in the beginning of the film because I was like the one of the lead females in the movie hasn't said a single word and we're 20 minutes in and I was so angered by that and then when they revealed that that's the whole point it like really hit me and it was really funny but I like that the whole movie is actually genuinely hilarious good good anybody else i noticed reading a lot of the moodle posts is that what a lot of people said is that it's really it acts as a nice escape from what's happening right now oh yeah which, which i think um i kind of talked about this in and i think i talked about it in my moodle post i know i talked about it on my worksheet but that's kind of one of the reasons that musical theater and theater in general kind of exist is even if it's a serious topic, it's kind of to bring you out and movies too, is um, to bring you out of the situation you're in. And especially like with comedies and stuff, it's to kind of make you forget maybe not so happy things that are happening right now. So it was interesting to see how we all kind of thought that and appreciated it for that reason too. Good, thank you. Anybody else want to join in on this? Uh, somebody want to talk about some things that they had problems with? I knew one or two people posted about that. Um, yeah, I, oh, do you want to go first? Sure. I didn't necessarily had a, had a 
problem with it, but I did notice um, like the differences between that film and like films today. I felt like the plot was very simplistic compared to most plots. And I wrote in mine um, that I recently watched Frozen 2, um, which is funny because that's a, a children's film or, you know, like children can watch it and to follow the plot and everything and I felt like there was more happening in that plot than in Singing in the Rain but I I didn't mind it um I actually enjoyed how simplistic the plot was um but I just thought that was interesting because I feel like movies today are catering to our attention spans and we have to put in a lot of stuff in the plot nowadays instead of just having a simplistic one so okay good Bryn were you gonna come in yeah, I was. Um, something that I noticed, especially um, from watching the, spe the specific scene analysis over and over again, was that like when Gene Kelly was tap dancing and really when anyone's tap dancing, it, there are times when it's like super obvious that there aren't actually taps on the bottom of their shoes and they added like the tap sounds in later. And it's so it's not, it doesn't like always sync up very well. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. And by the way, our chapter on sound uh, next week is going to talk a lot about that kind of stuff. Yeah, but something that I said in my post is that the choreography in and of itself is so impressive that I don't necessarily think that that asynchronous like foot movement and tap sounds doesn't really like take away from the overall quality of the film. Okay, good. All right, anybody else before I move on? Uh, just relating to the dancing and everything, I was just blown away by both Donald O'Connor. I don't feel like he gets enough credit in this for his role as Cosmo. Like, there are times where I'm like, how did he just do that? He, like, seems to float up onto the piano whenever he jumps jumps up on there, and just his athleticism and everything is astounding. Sorry about the train sounds. I'm still on campus. <laughs> right. It, it's probably nostalgic for the class. <laughs> All right, well, good. We can we could also come back to that. That uh, let's see, what am I doing here? All right, so uh, as you know, the film begins in the middle of things. Premiere uh, of the movie uh, gives Don a chance to tell his story from the beginning. So in all kinds of ways, they have structured the film as part of the narrative structure to let us peek into the history of Hollywood films. So we get to get to see them as young kids, and then. Uh, barroom entertainers, and then of course, finally, we come up to the roots of vaudeville, where uh, I think you're going to find out that lots of uh, live musicals and movie uh, musicals are going to draw most of their talent from. So uh, I think we've already talked about vaudeville in class a little bit. From the early uh, from the early 1880s to the 1930s, it was a big thing, a uh, big form of entertainment in this country all kinds of groups uh, made up on a common bill. So you might have dancers and singers and magicians and acrobats and jugglers and lecturers and minstrels. Uh, that was all part of uh, the big vaudeville show. And uh, so these were the vaudevillians who later became uh, our early movie stars, especially our uh, comic and musical movie stars. So let's see, da da da, and we got, uh, instances of that. Uh, it's now a, a trope with the hooks uh, from vaudeville that drag people off stage. Uh, it becomes part of the uh, visual bit joke of that. And then the outlandish costumes are there. Uh, you still see that, by the way, uh, a little bit in, uh, in uh, like live country music shows. They still do the outlandish costume kind of thing in Nashville. Let's see, uh, a lot of these vaudevillians uh, were, uh, were ones that broke into the business. I won't read all the names there, but you can see Mae West and W.C. Fields and Buster Keaton, the Marx Brothers, the, the Three Stooges I don't have listed, uh, Allen and Burns, a whole lot of folks started in vaudeville and made it to the movies. That's also gonna include Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Red Skelton, uh, so, they uh, went from one medium to the next. Uh, the film's also about breaking into the business, and so we get to see that through uh, Don's life, too. So the actors typically had to start at the bottom and work their way up, uh, and we get the example here of being an extra or a stunt person, 
that leads you to the big part eventually. Uh, and of course, we get the way that Lena treats Don when he's just a uh, stunt person versus the way that she acts towards him later. So uh, now we get into movie musicals. Distinctly American Invention really uh, popped up in uh, vaudeville and music halls, but, uh, but the biggies is that uh, stage musicals associated with Broadway, as you know, Showboat, the first big musical play, 1927. Uh, also in 27, the first talky musical, The Jazz Singer, and uh, the one that uh, really set the standard for the genres, MGM's Broadway Melody in 1929. And a lot of Broadway Melody ends up in this particular film because you get the lyricist, Arthur Freed, who becomes the producer for this film and a lot of films. So Freed and Donnan and Kelly have combined to do all kinds of movie musicals. You could see a big list of them there. Uh, Me and My Gal, Zigfield Follies, uh, An American in Paris, and of course, uh, uh, this very famous film. Film's also about uh, comedy in many ways, and this was one of your discussion questions. I don't know if anybody answered it, but uh, anybody want to give a oral answer to uh, what you thought was going on with comedy in this and whether it was a parody of some person in their post mentioned that it was a this was actually a parody of a, of a musical or a satire of one but there's a, a lot of different uh, comedy in this anybody want to join in and chat a lot of slapstick elements to this there's just like a ton of physical comedy um cosmo is probably the best example like in make them laugh like at one point i thought he just broke himself and that's very like slapstick element but it's also kind of a parody and a satire because it's a movie about making a movie and it comes full circle at the end when you discover that like this movie is the movie of the story yeah so um and and it plays off of like stereotypes like lena the big like blonde diva mm -hmm. like that's sort of a satirical representation of like that series good good uh you know the other big thing and of course is i know we've talked about screwball comedies uh the beginning of how hitchcock's the bird started out but uh once again here are those characteristics uh kind of a uh a male versus female thing battle of the sexes uh, fast-paced repartee, farcical situations, uh, plot lines that uh, uh, will eventually involve courtship and sometimes pick social class conflict. So, which of these characteristics, if any of them, depict the uh, Don and Kathy story? Anybody? I think it definitely um, fits the first three uh -huh. um, bullet points. I mean, she's very even though she's a little bit more quiet and humble um kathy is still definitely a force to be reckoned with um i mean it uh, maybe not so much battle of the sexes but kind of um mistaken identities i mean she doesn't know who he is at first yeah. um the fast-paced repartee definitely mm -hmm. um I think there are some farcical situations, mainly in the um, the floor show number when she pops out of the cake and then it's there. Um, yeah, and and I guess the whole thing with her having to be the uh, the real voice of Lena. Mm -hmm. Part of that too. Good, yep. good. So yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Lots of uh, 